Hi, everybody, and uh, thanks for joining us today. Uh, welcome to the latest presentation in the National Consortium of Telehealth Resource Center's webinar series. These webinars are designed to uh, provide timely information and demonstrations to support and guide the development of your telehealth programs. Uh, typically, these webinars are presented on the third Thursday of every month. Uh, please do note this with this month's webinar is a rescheduled uh, event and, and we will return to our normal third Thursday uh, in the next month and moving forward. Uh, next slide, please. Just to get, uh, make sure everyone is familiar with the TRCs um, located throughout the country, there are 12 regional telehealth resource centers um, and there are also two national telehealth resource centers. Each one of us serves as focal points uh, for advancing the effective use of telehealth and supporting access to health, telehealth services in the rural and underserved communities. Uh, if you're not familiar with us, you can see your region on the map here and we're excited to uh, hear from you. Next slide, please. Just to uh, get level set for everybody and to do a few tips before we get started. Uh, your audio has already been muted. Uh, you can feel free to use the Q&A function uh, to ask questions throughout the event. We'll be actively monitoring those and we'll have a question session at the end. Uh, today's webinar is being recorded and you will be able to access the recording and today's slides on the NCTRC website and the NCTRC YouTube channel. Next slide, please. Today's webinar is hosted by the Northeast Telehealth Resource Center, uh, and my team is thrilled to uh, have our colleagues here to present from the Federation of State Medical Boards. So without further ado, I am going to turn it over, and it is my pleasure to introduce Michael Dugan and Lisa Robin. Thank you, Reid. You can um, advance the slide, please. So Mike and I are thrilled to be here today and uh, talk about Provider Bridge. This is a project that we are extremely proud of at the Federation of State Medical Boards. I am uh, the Chief Advocacy Officer. So uh, I've worked uh, on license portability for many, many years. We've had a number of grants uh, from HRSA on license portability and it's really uh, developed over time. Uh, it is, uh, we were able to developed the Interstate Medical Licensure Compact as a result of these grants. And then uh, certainly as a result of the um, license for coronavirus license portability grant, we were able to uh, really complete this very exciting project. So with that, um, with the, when the pandemic began, we recognized that the states were issuing their emergency orders and there was certainly a void. We realized a gap in having any sort of centralized tools available to mobilize physicians and other healthcare providers. So that's really what the purpose of this project has been. And that's what we're gonna talk about today. Uh, you can advance the next slide, please. So I just wanted to spend just a few minutes um, on some regulatory updates and what we're seeing legislatively at both the federal and the state level. There's a lot of activity, as all of you know, in the telemedicine space uh, that we are certainly monitoring and uh, supporting many of those uh, legislative endeavors. We're um, anxious to see what's going to happen after the pandemic, what stays and what telemedicine looks like going forward. But I think we've certainly learned a lot and how valuable it has been in being able to take care of patients, keep them out of the hospital, keep them out of the doctor's offices. And uh, it's, so it's been a real, uh, a real eye-opening thing, I think, for the delivery of healthcare in this country and, and moving forward. I don't think we will go back to as it was. So at the, there's a number of buckets of legislation that we're watching. Uh, most has to do with the removal of geographic restrictions um, as well as payment parity. At the state level, there, um, again, there's many, many bills that we're watching. Most have to do with uh, moving more toward uh, modality neutral, uh, allowing in expanding their telemedicine definition to include audio only as you as we found out when from the uh, digital divide that there were so many patients that didn't have access and, and really 
that audio only was their only means of visiting with their healthcare professionals. So um, with that, the, tele the Federation has telemedicine policy that we've had for a number of years. And in our definition, it says generally it would not include audio only. I think what we've learned is that the Federation, uh, it's time to look at our policies and our guidance documents. As the organization that members are the 71 state medical and osteopathic boards, we routinely do guidance documents and policy documents that the states use as they develop their own policy work. So we're looking forward to beginning this, uh, looking at our policies, looking at data, and uh, pulling together a work group that will include people from state medical boards, but also industry and, the, and regulators at the federal level. So that work will happen over the course of the next year. There's also work um, that's happening at the Uniform Law Commission. They are working toward a model uh, telemedicine regulation that they will be promoting to the states. I, that is still in the development stage. Some of you may be involved with that. Um, I think that we expect that that is getting close to a final document, I believe. And so maybe over the course of the next few months, we will see, uh, be able to take a look at that and, uh, and see if there's something that we can really build consensus around. The other thing that we're really watching and very pleased about is the Interstate Medical Licensure Compact. That compact has been uh, enacted in 30 states, the District of Columbia and Guam. We're also, have, it's also been introduced in a number of other states and we're very hopeful that it will pass this legislative session and uh, we will continue to see that compact grow. Um, They've issued close to 20,000 licenses through the compact now. And I think it is certainly, they saw a big uptick in uh, during the pandemic and issuing the most licenses in a month that, that they have ever, uh, ever had that level of, of business through the compact. So I know that there is, um, it's not the perfect answer for many and is particularly in just one-offs or consultations, but I do think that this is certainly something that's gotten a lot of positive feedback from physicians around the country. So we uh, look forward to growing it this year. And then certainly once again, as the next year's sessions begin and pre-filing start in the fall. So at the uh, conclusion, we're happy to answer any questions about any policy issues. We're seeing a lot of states that are looking at their own policies and what, the, what will it look like going forward. Uh, we have our annual meeting next week. We are, uh, I think that will be a big item of discussion to talk about what medicine is gonna look like going forward. So uh, stay tuned and we look forward to working with many of you as we go down this path of policy development. So with that, you can advance the slides and I would like to uh, pass this on to uh, Mr. Mike Dugan. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, let's see, this is a picture of uh, COVID, some of the regulatory resources that Lisa was referring to that are available on the Provider Bridge site. So we have this set of links and then the next slide uh, shows some uh, FAQs specific to, if you drill in through the FAQs on Provider Bridge, there's a section just on policy. So hopefully uh, that is a, a valuable resource to folks. And I, I think we track the traffic. This, these, these sections uh, really did get a lot of uh, traffic, particularly in early to mid months uh, of the pandemic. So I think the next slide is just a header slide. So we have two sections, um, a little bit of background and an introduction, an overview on Provider Bridge, and then whatever, a PowerPoint demo, if you will, we have, we're gonna run through the functionality. It won't be live, uh, we didn't wanna risk that, but we have enough in the PowerPoint. You can pretty much see everything that's in the application. 
Next slide, please. Yeah, Lisa mentioned, uh, Lisa works a lot with HRSA on portability initiatives and we've had uh, other, other grants, <clears throat> excuse me. And early in the pandemic, we had some conversations about activities that we were undergoing, uh, you know, it was a mad scramble. And one of the things that we did was help uh, the state of New York is one example. They had a, a list of names, they needed to vet those names quickly and try to, uh, you know, you know, do some quick qualification of, of folks. So the, uh, we picked up on some trends and some things that we thought could be helpful in this process going forward. So these conversations led to uh, a proposal and then we were fortunate enough to receive this grant from HRSA. Uh, we have the four goals here that were communicated in the grant. So they have been, it is a COVID-19 specific grant. Uh, perhaps in the discussion, we can talk about that. We do hope that this lives on past the pandemic, uh, but they, in addition to focusing on COVID-19, they're very specific about telehealth technologies because uh, they, they see that as a great facilitator in these situations. So in addition to the communication of, uh, you know, the, the things that we, Lisa talked about, we did talk about a technology platform, and that's what the demo will go into. But it's designed to streamline the process for healthcare professionals during pandemics or public health emergencies. And you know, at FSMB, we deal with physicians and physician assistants. But this is not just an FSMB uh, project. Even though we were the main recipient in the grant, uh, the intent here is to expand it to other healthcare professions, and we have some very good news there. Uh, and, and we hope the list continues to grow. Uh, and then provide education and outreach. I think this meeting today uh, is an example of that. We're trying to spread the word about Provider Bridge and hope, hoping it can be used as a resource. Next slide, please. So this is a list of our, uh, the Provider Bridge partners and FSMB, we're thankful. We, we had existing data sharing agreements with NCCPA and, and ABMS, and uh, we're very thankful they allowed us to expand that usage into the provider bridge. And uh, we have a, oh, a special thanks to the National Council of State Boards of Nursing. Uh, that, that's a whole new sort of platform for us, if you will, a uh, whole new, uh, I think we've, we've worked with them on policy and things, but we have never had a data sharing opportunity. And they have gone sort of the extra step, if you will, and took on a fair amount of development to be able to, to accommodate Provider Bridge and even promote, promote Provider Bridge in their nurses platform, which is a platform used by uh, nurses across the country. Uh, next, next slide, please. This, I won't stay on this one too long. This is just the homepage. And uh, hopefully you'll see, it. we've tried to make this uh, easy to use, very understandable. Hopefully that comes across in this homepage, you, you know, list of users at the top and then uh, call outs that are supposed to be very obvious. If you come to this site, hopefully it's quite evident uh, where you should go from, from the main page. Next slide. Okay, this was a uh, sort of a flow chart, I guess, if you will, but it's intended to, you know, describe the functionality and the workflow that we have. So up at the top, uh, on the left, we have providers and uh, provider users come in and as you'll see, they're, they're, it's pretty easy. You register and you request a licensure report and that's, that's about it. On the entity side, and this was based on the experience that we had uh, with some of these, uh, with the states and a couple of large health systems, we, we uh, planned some additional functionality. So uploading a roster, uh, searching folks that have raised their hand in, in the application, perhaps you can find volunteers that way, some data reporting, and then dashboard functionality. So the rosters and the dashboards, that functionality is live. Some of the other functionality is uh, planned in some of our subsequent releases. And it's interesting, 
you know, we're the Federation of State Medical Boards and we deal with medical boards, but we're very clearly, we say entity there. When you get into these situations, medical boards, their data is involved, but they're really not the users. They're not the entities that are uh, qualifying individuals that would need to use this functionality. So down in the lower half of the, of the diagram, we list our partners, again, NCCPA and ABMS. And then you'll see the, uh, those other three lines are intended to uh, indicate data connectivity. So these are real-time data access, API-driven access points uh, that fuel the application. And our main output is what we call a blue ribbon report. And we'll, we'll show a de uh, several of those. Next slide, please. Real quick, high-level technical overview. Is we uh, design it as a cloud-hosted system. It gives us scalability and, uh, you know, we'll see how, how things live on. But, you know, you know with uh, pandemics or emergencies, some of these things you have to turn on and turn off. Uh, cloud functionality also provides the latest in security. So that was important. A uh, couple of things we'd like to point out. This is not a new centralized database. We're not collecting, uh, you know, information and having it ready just in case. We, when somebody comes in and requests a record, we go out, we get the record that's been asked for, and then, and then pull that back for the reporting purposes. It, it's not a new pathway for licensure or privileging. It's really rapid certification of existing licensure and specialty for sp folks that hold specialty, excuse me, information that that makes that available. So, and in this case, it was designed around the licensure waivers, which are common in emergency situations. Uh, the last point is certificate-based documents used for verification. And I, I have a couple of slides to get into that more. This is a, uh, the, the next slide, I think is a very high level uh, diagram uh, of, digital signature infrastructure, and FSMB has been doing research in recent years related to um, just dig digital signatures and enabling the holders of credentials to hold custody of that. We see a lot of redundancies in some of these uh, uh, CVO processes, and uh, we're trying to enable uh, personal ownership of your own credentials. So our current incarnation of that are digital signatures. So the certificate-based signatures, there's a public key, private key infrastructure, but it allows verification of a signature document. Every, everyone uses this every day. This is how you know you're on a website that you expect it to be, and it, it builds a system of trust. This is the same infrastructure that's used if you use uh, electronic signature services such as uh, DocuSign or Adobe, for example. So that's, that's how we Im implemented this portability that we were seeking. And then the next slide shows uh, sort of how, how you can validate it. And I think in this case, it's important because you don't know when you're gonna need the document. If it's truly an emergency situation, you, know, you might be able to show up and, and wanna prove who you are. So we think this enables some of that functionality. The, uh, I think this is from an Adobe reader, uh, and this is, this is PDF driven. Uh, this example shows the signature panel using Adobe. This functionality is becoming very common in the uh, latest versions of browsers, uh, such as Chrome and uh, 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 Edge. So, you can tell looking at that signature panel, this is a, after you click the signature panel, I highlighted the certified by FSMB and has our name on it. Uh, you can see at the top there, that's where we got the blue ribbon name, that this is a certified document. These documents are tamper proof, tamper evident uh, rather. And if it had been modified, this certification would not show up. So that's, uh, again, we're trying to build trust here with the documents, but make them easy to use. Uh, the next slide, I think we're gonna transition into the demo. So uh, next slide, please. So that's a, 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 an example 
of the uh, not if you haven't clicked into the signature panel, that's the uh, what the document looks like. I think on the next one, next slide, please. We have an example that's um, uh, this is a test, but it shows you some of the elements that are available. And the uh, the nursing report is similar in format. It's not exactly like this. And uh, uh, well, real quick, the update on on the nursing. Uh, we are exchanging data with NCSBN. Their application allows nurses to sign up for Provider Bridge, and they are doing it at a very rapid clip. We get more than 100 a day that have qualified. So in a short period of time, they're already at 4,000 nurses that have registered. So we're very excited about that. And uh, I don't know if I stressed it enough. We, we think it's a, an exciting uh, uh, development to be able to you know one, one place and you can pull licensure reports for nurses, physician assistants, and physicians. That's, uh, we, we think it's very powerful. Uh, this example, to drill into some of the elements of the report, we tried to make the date of issue very prominent because the currency of these types of documents is very important. Uh, you'll see some qualifying or identifying information at the top. So you know that you can, this, is, this, belong, this document belongs to this person and then no actions reported also at the top. Uh, high level ABMS certifications, you know, on specialty data, uh, if you're not specialty certified, we do some self-reporting, but this isn't intended to be a, you know, drill down into, you know, um, all of the, there are many details associated when, with uh, your specialty certification when you hold that. This isn't intended to show all those elements, but just verify the fact that you are in fact certified. Then we list license numbers again, uh, not any of the details, but the number in the state and the same thing with the active DEA numbers and the um, uh, parentheses show the prescribing panels that are associated with that license. Uh, next slide, please. This is an example, and it's, uh, I don't know if it's intentional, it looks a little blurry on my screen anyway, I don't know if that's intentional, but the, uh, if there are board actions, and we have seen time and time again when there are emergencies that uh, some of the bad actors come out and they maybe see it as an opportunity to, to get back into practice or to, uh, uh, you know, participate. So uh, this calls out, if there is a report that has a board action, we tried to make it uh, very evident, very clear. And what you'll see, and we will say, not all board actions are created equal. You know, some could be, uh, you know, administrative or you know laid on a CME or something like that. So we do, I don't have an example of it, but um, with the main document, we really tried to focus on it being one page. If, if it is a, a situation that triggers the board action, those are added on subsequent pages. I don't think we have an example of that, but it explains it because there is, again, it, it deserves looking at. And uh, you know, in, in some cases it's, it's nothing to be alarmed about, but in, uh, uh, certainly when it's bad, it can be very bad. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so that's, so this, uh, we have some slides on the functionality uh, and I, I won't belabor them, but this is where you would start and you'd select your profession. Uh, next slide, I think are some bullet points. So uh, for provi on the provider side, we say it's currently available for physician and physician assistants. The, for nurses, there are links, but it, it, it uh, and I will, I think gracefully it takes you over to the nurses system where you register. That, that bullet's referring to uh, registering on an ID on the Provider Bridge website. Right now, nurses do that on nurses, and then we receive the information that they can then, they can be queried. Uh, so we'll see, and, and this, I should also point out, we are, we're interested, you know, the more the merrier here. We've had conversations with some of the other specialty groups or uh, professional professions uh, beyond what we've discussed. And some of those are ongoing, but we're, we, we uh, are certainly open to adding additional uh, professions. There's secure login credentials. And uh, after you create your ID, 
the main functionality is downloading your passport. We'll show you that. And then this connects you to healthcare entities. I think the next slide is real simple. This is, for, uh, if you're a, a provider, this is the, uh, the fields. You'll see there's a mix. Some of those may be somewhat small, but there's a mix of optional and required fields. Again, we've tried to make it easy to use. Uh, legal name, uh, date of birth is optional. We do need an email. And then uh, your primary practice. Uh, HRSA has asked that we ask about telemedicine and we've had uh, some TRC feedback on that that we're discussing. There may, we may expand some of the telehealth fields. Uh, and then for us to do a match, the uh, uh, any or, uh, you know, if you can provide multiple of these identifiers, we're uh, guaranteed a match, but we make it available to search on multiple fields. So then the next slide shows. Uh, and this is for the provider functionality. This is it. Once you're done and you've we've we've successfully completed it and it's ready to download, you're able to download your uh, we call it a passport. Next slide. Okay. Now back to the entity side. So again, back to the main page. Uh, next slide. A little bit of information about um, healthcare entities. This is also behind uh, secure login credentials. As, a, as an individual, you can go out and it's automated. Create your account and you're ready to go. With healthcare entities, we do some vetting. So uh, we've been able to turn these around very quickly and we've had support staff ready to go, but we don't allow, automatically allow that because we understand that, uh, you know, that, uh, well, we, we wanna know who's using the system and make sure that they're uh, credible and it, it, it is for the intended use. So after the vetting process, which is, has gone well for us, you're on and you're able to look up and retrieve passports, uh, physician, physician assistants, nurses. Our, uh, we're still working on some of the nursing functionality. We'll have that uh, uh, middle of next month that will all be complete and uh, they'll be fully part of the, the functionality. And then uh, you'll have the opportunity to search for providers. So let's see the next slide. It will look familiar. Uh, this is how to register your entity, and this would create that uh, that email where we take this, we contact you, and then uh, once you're good, we create the ID and you go from there. Uh, the next couple slides, but the next slide. So this should look familiar. Again, it's uh, the, the, we start up at the top. If you want to search on a provider, you'll see those fields should look familiar because those are our search fields that will match what was entered on the physician side. You see a little hint of a provider list there at the bottom. And this, I mentioned in the dashboard. Uh, next slide, please. Here's the dashboard functionality. We're uh, uh, pretty proud of this. We think this is, should be very user-friendly. So if I go down the left-hand side, you can see some icons there. That first one, the spinning wheel, means that uh, that query is underway. So you can actually see if, if uh, and, and if you upload multiple names, that becomes pretty important. You can see the ones as they complete. A green check mark means it's completed in there. And then the red exclamation, uh, there was an issue with the query, likely a key field, uh, but you know it could have been, uh, uh, I guess any and any number of issues. The active license, we have the, the green bell. And if there's an action, you see the red gavel. So uh, you can sort on those fields. So if you, so let's say you low upload 100 and, okay, I wanna drill down on folks that have action. You can do that rather quickly uh, with this dashboard. And then all the way to the right, the, the remaining two functions, you can remove someone uh, from your list with the, the red minus sign or you can download the report with the, uh, uh, the download icon. Next slide, please. Uh, and this is a search field. I, I believe some of the search functionality is in uh, subsequent builds where we are today, but it's, it's underway. And uh, this is a, should be, uh, we think a powerful tool if you're starting from scratch and uh, you know, 
and, and we saw this in the pandemic, there was, there was some of that. Um, I, I also think later in the pandemic, it, it seemed that institutions maybe had their own list. So they still needed to vet folks, but perhaps they didn't need the search quite as much. But in the end, we think it'll be a helpful functionality. Uh, next slide. Okay. So that uh, quite a few uh, PowerPoint slide there. Hopefully we uh, did that at a good pace and we're ready for, for any questions that anyone might have. Yeah, I think that was a great pace. I think we have a, I think we have a fair share of time for questions. Thank you both. Um, and I, we do have two questions um, already in the queue, um, but for the attendees that are here, please do feel free uh, either in the Q&A uh, button on the bottom of your, your black Zoom bar at the bottom of your screen, or you can use the chat function. Um, if you're more familiar with that, I am watching both. Um, so I'm gonna just toss the question out there and you guys can kind of decide who, how you're gonna answer it or who's gonna answer it, deal? Uh, the first question was uh, if mes medical residents could be mobilized uh, through the provider bridge and uh, if that's a part of your planning down the line or if that's something you're already going into. The, uh, the I'm sorry, the, for the residents? Yep. Right. So we focus on, uh, well, it's, it's quite possible we would have data on residents just because uh, now this, you know, the, talking about physicians here, we have a, a great deal of, of physician data as they come through the licensing process. Uh, so it, they could certainly pull a report. Uh, the other thing, you know, many residents have a, a, meta, a full license even after one year, certainly after two years of residency. So, you know, in that case, it's, uh, you know, uh, they would just show up just like the standard report. It, it would, uh, you know, be available. I, I'll be honest, I don't think it would indicate, we're, we just keep track of licenses. So if, you know, it wouldn't be a li training license or show this is a resident, it would look just like the standard report. Awesome, thanks. Um, just to add my own little spin on that. Um, so in a, uh, have a future scenario where we do need to mobilize, you know, providers uh, in a large scale. Uh, there were a few sort of stipulations added to our nearly tr fully trained medical uh, students throughout the last year. Is that if there were sort of a expansion to the full licensure status of residents, that's a new year. Is that something that you guys think you'd be able to sort of pair into what you've built? I think our, our challenge um, on this has been the way states report to us. They're not completely, uh, there's not a standard, you know, on these codes like, that would indicate, well, this is a, you know, a resident uh, as such. I mean, it's certainly something where, uh, you know, if we could work with the states to get a, a better standard on that, we'd be happy to deliver it uh, and present it like that on the report. Or I would just add that for residents, states license them differently. In some states, a resident, you know, you can get a license after one year of postgraduate training. There's a few that you can get a license until three years. Some of them have training licenses, some, some maybe just uh, licensed institutions. So I think that that's one challenge because the states do treat residents differently. Both great answers. And I mean, like most things, uh, a little bit different by the state you're looking at. And uh, therefore, that's a bridge we'll cross if we have to when we come to it. Uh, it makes sense. Um, so I, uh, I'm just going to call out one question that Lisa was able to answer in the chat in case folks hadn't seen it. Um, there was a question around whether or not there was a charge for providers to register into the provider bridge. Um, and there is no charge for the providers or for the entities, which Lisa, just to clarify, I'm assuming you mean health systems if they were to be the ones entering all the information. Awesome. All right. So now we're going back to uh, another question over here. In theory, could this system be used as 
as a, uh, like a matchmaking service of sorts for organizations who are searching for telehealth-based clinicians for usual services, um, maybe not just in response to a public health emergency. So, you know, uh, specialty consults or things of that nature. Well, I think theoretically, uh, yes, you know, we have, we very focused on working inside of the scope from the, the HRSA grant, which has been specific to that. We are trying to have conversations about how we, we move forward. We think it's great functionality and, uh, you know, looking ahead, sort of a sustainability model. Uh, and, you know, perhaps that's something that, you know, could come into play there. But you know, right now, you know, again, it, it's sort of, it, it was grant funded. So, you know, it was, uh, there, there are no charges, as Lisa mentioned. So I think the, uh, the commercial aspect of that perhaps is something that we'd have to be sensitive to, not necessarily rule it out, but we'd ha certainly have to be sensitive to that. Do you say anything to add there? Anything to add on your end on that one or? Oh, no. no. Awesome, okay. So uh, while we give folks a second to digest on uh, those answers and perhaps provide some more questions, uh, I'm gonna return to an answer, a question that I had answered via text during there to give Lisa a chance to um, kind of elaborate on what I know I'm missing. Uh, so there was a question around some of the compacts when you mentioned the interstate medical licensure compact. And I had referenced, let's see here, I think I pulled four. So I had I pulled the interstate medical licensure compact, the nursing one, which coincidentally Mike mentioned right as I pulled it. Um, I also grabbed the EMS compact, the replica, um, and the sci pact, the new psychology, new-ish psychology one. Um, but I sort of just made a little vague reference to the fact that those are not nearly all of them. Um, and I didn't know if maybe you wanted to expand on that a little bit. Sure, I'm happy to. Yes, sir. And I think more are in development right now. In fact, uh, as part of our other license portability grant, we are working with the physician assistants, working with the National uh, Commission on Certification of Physician Assistants, NCCPA, and the um, American Academy of Physician Assistants on a compact for physician assistance. That work has begun. We actually had a small drafting group. We have um, a model drafted that should go out for comment uh, of the model um, to regulatory boards and other stakeholders within the next uh, week or two. So that work is coming along. We would like to get it pretty much uh, finalized, the model legislation, before next uh, state legislatures open. And so trying to get that work accomplished. Uh, I know that there is compacts for occupational therapies working on a compact, uh, the audiologist. So I think this is uh, compacts of sort, and they are different, the physical therapy, uh, they're different models. Some are truly uh, uh, more of the mutual recognition model, more of a driver's license model. The, the physician one is, is unique because uh, the physicians are granted a license in every state in which they are licensed uh, and wish to practice. Um, so yeah, I think that, that you will see, uh, it, they're really based on how that profession practices. So the PA one is very, it's gonna be very different than the, the medical model as well. It's more, it's based more on that mutual recognition model. Awesome, thank you. Yes, yeah, hey, so, uh, Jennifer, to the and when I said that, yeah, I'm happy to chat about more. Uh, Lisa is also happy to chat about more and it's, it, she definitely has a little bit more insight to share as well. Um, I'm gonna combine two questions here because I think uh, they go together well and uh, it maybe we can, uh, for folks that are able to watch the recording later, we'll reference them to the slide where I think you might've covered this. Um, the application is currently live and accepting pay, uh, providers and health sites, correct? Correct. And it, in your outreach slash data population stage, what is the sort of protocol for health sites that are just finding out about you today um, and maybe want to go on? Are they just logging onto the website and diving in or should they contact one of you two? 
we'd love to have uh, additional partners. And I see, I don't know, uh, Nur Rajwani is in the Q&A uh, and he's the leader from NCSBN. So to acknowledge Nur and his team. Uh, but I think they're a really good example. Uh, they promoted it on the nursing site and it's uh, the usage has far exceeded on the physician site. So we are looking at uh, uh, you know, other partners, I think some of these we may, maybe we're on the cusp of, so maybe we shouldn't say names that you may be familiar with, but we, if anybody has a suggestion or, you know, because there's data integration is the highest level uh, or the most detailed level, but we're happy to, to link and just, you know, sort of cross promotion, perhaps, you know, if it's a specialty group or an advocacy group, uh, we're, we're open to all of that because it is supposed to be an open tool and we're happy to have as many providers just go ahead and sign up it just takes really seconds to get that done um so we're we're, we're pleased to have this opportunity today because i, I do think that this is some uh, that we uh it's not widely known that this is available i've had a lot of interest uh, a lot of calls lately from even from folks on the Hill um, interested in, as they are looking at moving down the road with how do we better prepare in the future to have this tool available. So uh, yeah, anyone that's interested in signing up, I think uh, we'd, we'd love that. Awesome, yeah, and I did throw the, the link in the, to the website in the chat for those that uh, wanna take a sneak peek before the slides come out. Um, we have two more questions here, and uh, Nur, I, to, to Mike's point, uh, we're glad you're here, and uh, please feel free to, whether you have a uh, context or questions, and I'll watch for both, um, but the, so I'm going to dive into the, the more in-depth one here, because so we've got a little bit of time for it. Um, at the start of the public health emergency, so a little over a year ago now, um, a lot of technical assistance questions coming in along the lines of the emergency licensure waivers and the issues that were sort of lifted with that, um, but there was still concern from the health sites and the providers regarding uh, both reimbursement um, and the malpractice uh, insurance coverage uh, and whether or not those waivers and interstate considerations applied to both of those concrete different things, right? Um, and so I guess the overarching question there is, uh, is that something that this database is attempting to interact with as either of those questions this database interacting with? Well, our resource, the, the customer service hub of Provider Bridge, we try to gather as much information as possible on the specifics of the waivers and try to communicate that as well as what's come out from, you know, um, as far as liability under the uh, PREP Act. So, you know, we're we're happy to um, try to include as much of that information as possible. We don't really, as a rule, the FSMB doesn't really get into the liability and payment issues, but we've been, we have tried to, to put as much, to be as, um, brought a resource as comprehensive as, as possible. And so if anyone has suggestions or other information that they would like to see included, uh, we'd be happy to consider that. I think the more comprehensive in a centralized place, it serves all of us well. If you can hear me typing, I'm sharing two links of yours that I am personally quite fond of uh, for the last year um, that are not directly uh, linked on Provider Bridge, although maybe I just haven't found it, um, but that are on your overarching FSMB site, which is where you're tracking some of the emergency, uh, the executive orders at the various state levels um, and some of the federal waivers. And so I'm just grabbing those two links for folks um, in case they haven't seen them, because I know they have been a huge help for me. Um, Mike might want to speak to the customer service hub because that information has been that should it lives in both places and yet on the customer service hub we do even have a, a staff person to answer your questions. Right and we'll so I don't know about this particular one and how many of those we've had but it's, it's absolutely something we'd be happy to add to the FAQ mm -hmm. uh, and, and I think if we get a question more than uh, once or twice where, you know, we, we try to get it out there. Uh, 
for those that are uh, maybe I'm not as familiar with me, I'm practicing my project echo pause of five seconds, which is hard for me, but that is uh, it's an intentional pause there. I didn't want to interrupt Mike and his thought. Um, I will call out my own mistake. I was sending the links just to my panelists who I know know them. Um, so you now all should find the links that I have been referencing for the last few minutes in your chat box. Um, Lisa, I may need your help uh, kind of expanding upon what the question is here. And uh, to Teresa, who had asked it, if I'm butchering your question, please feel free to follow up with an explanatory one. But I think this gets back to some of the licensure uh, compact considerations again. Um, and it was asking if we could speak a little bit more about the, uh, the NP slash APP model that you referenced. That nurse practitioner compact model is... I really don't know the specifics of that compact, the, the nursing compact I'm much more familiar with. Uh, and I'm not quite sure how many states have adopted the nurse practitioner compact, it's newer. Um, and Nur may want to add that into the Q&A because he would be 34 states. So he's uh, much more knowledgeable about that than I am. And I'm sure that you can go on their website and find out more about that nurse practitioner compact. Awesome. Yeah, thank you, Lisa. To that point, I will try to um, find the exact link on the NC SBN website, um, but you should be able to get there on the li nursing licensure compact link that I had sent earlier as well. They're into the same hub. Um, and we do have a, a staff member on that group here today. Um, so we can facilitate connections there as well if needed. Uh, folks can reach out to anybody here. I would like to just add that I know that um, HRSA's learning series that they offer, that the I believe it is in May, they have planned, they have um, individuals from each of these healthcare professional compacts to give a presentation. I don't uh, recall the date in May, but I know that that is um, on their schedule and I've seen the various executive directors of these compacts have been submitting their bios and everything. So I know that that is happening. Awesome. Yeah. And so that's uh, that's definitely something for folks to keep an eye on. I know that um, I'm interested in that as well. And so I'm happy to uh, follow up with Lisa and make sure and with our HRSA colleagues and make sure that we have that information um, at Netrick and at the TRCs um, for folks that maybe have a hard time hunting that down. But if you are unfamiliar, um, the federal HRSA office does host a monthly uh, telehealth learning webinar series. Uh, this month's was focused on the broadband funding opportunities, I believe. Just doing a quick scan here for questions. That's, I mean, I think that's a great point. I think that gets to, uh, so this, I, you, you two can read this with me. Um, the, the comment is just thinking about the distinctions that Lisa was pointing out when you look at different compacts and also just sort of different uh, professional status. Um, just that it would be nice, right, if there was a chart for all of them. Um, and I think Michael, uh, you heard Mike kind of uh, mention that as well when it comes to data, right? Like they do have to kind of be aware of which what, what they can get from each state. Um, so I suppose that gets to the emerging landscape. And I know that, yeah, feel free to add in here. No, I think that's a great idea. We do have links to the other compacts in the customer service hub uh, and the FAQs, but I think that that's something we could certainly be um, happy to work on. And Reed, I, we really like, I liked your math. We may um, yeah. Uh, yeah, have was, to, I, uh, whatever the right phrase is. Uh, <laughs> Telehealth locator. Yeah, that's too, that's uh, too uh, up and coming here. And I am, that's one of the reasons why I was excited about this presentation as well. Um, it's, it's a, uh, yeah, that's going to be a neat opportunity. Um, and I think that the opportunity for sort of population health data interacting with telehealth is something that multiple sort of avenues of healthcare that I uh, realize is going to be a fun conversation personally. So, Aria, I do know that we have an evaluation that um, I will totally forget to uh, put up in time if you don't remind me, but we do have time probably for one or two more questions. If anybody has any, feel free. I see that, uh, Teresa, I see that you have your hand raised. Um, uh, I am not the host, so I might not be able to unmute you. Uh, Aria, if we can, could you unmute Teresa? And if we cannot, Teresa, could you put your question in the chat for us?
might have been an accidental hand raise. I do that as well. That button's in a tricky spot. <laughs> um, deal. That's what I thought. All right. So yeah, I mean, I, I am happy to, I could probably come up with a couple of questions of my own. Um, I am sure that Lisa and Mike are happy to stay with me for a few more minutes. Um, but I know that they like me are also aware that it's always nice sometimes when you get a few minutes left in your day. Um, so if folks do have, or uh, would like to head out, I uh, will try to grab our link for our evaluation. Um, perfect timing. Thank you. Um, we would love if you could take that. Uh, before I get there, though, um, a quick reminder, this webinar on this fourth Thursday of April was uh, a little bit out of the order for the NCTRC one. We'll be returning to third Thursday of next month. Uh, and it'll be at 11 a.m. Pacific time, 2 p.m. Eastern time, if you like me. Um, and the next TRC that will be hosting the event is the our, our colleagues at the Upper Midwest Telehealth Resource Center. Um, with that, next slide, thank you, my friend. Uh, there is a survey monkey here that I believe also pop up as the as you leave the event. Uh, we would very much appreciate if you could take the time to fill that out. Um, I believe my colleagues here would also be appreciative of it. Um, we're all we're all folks that sort of thrive off feedback. So thank you to everyone that was able to take time for this today. Um, and I hope everyone has a great one. Thank you. Yes, thanks everybody.